wanted to do that since I was five years old. I am so excited. Oh, man, how much fun is that? Which, that I want to get one of those for my man cave when I come in and out and stuff. Can you imagine how much fun for children to come out, to spend time in Vacation Bible School, hearing about Jesus Christ, and having that as just the backdrop? That's only part of it. Isn't that cool? Hey, would you help me thank all of those who have worked so hard on that stuff? Man, they are a great team. Do me a favor, would you, if you have your Bibles with you, take them and turn to 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 1. This is, we're going to look at about a full chapter of 1 Kings, but we don't have time to read it all. So I'm going to tell part of the story as we make some applications about today, about parenting, fatherhood, motherhood, and investing in the next generation. About a year, year and a half ago, I came across an article online. It was actually a service that you could hire. And I, I didn't believe it at first, and it's a true thing. And it, the offer was, it was outsourcing potty training. <laughs> you could hire people to potty train your children. Did you know this? Started actually quite a few years ago. In fact, the price has gone up. The original price in New York City, 2014, for 1750 bucks. They will come in, and in two days, they will potty train your children. True, true story, true. Uh, two ladies came up with the business idea. It's now gone all over across the nation. In fact, you can outsource all kinds of parenting that you yourself don't enjoy. For example, now, I'll be, I'll be honest, I'm not the smartest guy, but I don't know how this happens. But you can outsource weaning your children, evidently. I don't know how you do that, but anyway, you can do it. Um, if your children have bad sleep habits, any of you have children with bad sleep habits, you can hire people to come into your house, and they will train your children to have the appropriate sleep habits. It's starting to sound like obedience school for puppies. That's what it's starting to sound like. And according to this, there's all kinds of services you can hire. But according to one person, the mom said this. She goes, I love my kids, but I hate parenting. And so you can take all the hard stuff and you can outsource it to someone else. I got to be honest with you. You tell me you can potty train any child in two days. Good luck. Good luck. We'll see how that goes for you. And when I saw that whole thing, I thought to myself, man, wouldn't it be something if all the hard things in life you could just outsource and pay somebody else to do? But can I tell you, if you're a parent who's here today, a grandparent who's here today, by the way, we got some dads in the house. I'm glad dads. This message is going to challenge us a little bit because there is some stuff you simply cannot, you can't outsource. God has called us to raise up our children. He has called us to invest in the next generation. I don't care how much you want to outsource it, and let's just be honest, sometimes it is hard being a parent. But God calls us to invest in the next generation to come. I want to take you to 1 Kings chapter 1. The story is David. David is coming down to the end of his life. He is, um, he's got six wives. He has 18 sons. He has uh, quite a number of daughters. He is coming down to the end of his life. He's very frail, so frail, in fact, they have to have someone else. They get, they get a young lady to come in and just sleep in the same bed, no intimacy. That was very clear in Scripture, just simply to try to keep them warm. Today, we'd get them a heating blanket. They didn't have those back then. And so they bring him in, and he is failing quickly. And he may be a man after God's own heart, but i got to tell you, David was not the greatest dad. He wasn't the greatest family man. And it's interesting because when you come down, his son Solomon was supposed to be the next king. That's his, that's his son by Bathsheba. In fact, he had made the pledge and had actually promised Bathsheba, your son is going to be on the throne. In fact, not only was Solomon his choice, he was actually God's choice for the next person to be the king of Israel. But the other boys had a little something to say about that. And so Scripture says that there was, there was Absalom, who was his oldest child. He's, a, he's, a, he's got other issues with him. But then he's got the next one. In fact, Scripture says in chapter 1, verse 5, Adonijah, whose mother was, it looks like Haggith. It's not, it's Haget. That's how you say it. That's an unfortunate pronunciation. His mother wanted him to be the king, and so he, the second-born son, puts himself forward as the king. He hires 50 guys to go in front of him throughout Jerusalem 
declaring, Adonijah is the king. Adonijah is the king. Long live the king. He convinces some key military people as well as some key influential politicians to come alongside and support him. He didn't get the the big ones, but he got the second tier. He then went to a place and he sacrificed many animals to the Lord. It was a declaration that God was somehow ordaining him. And then he held a huge feast. He invited all the influential people. He invited the influential uh, uh, army individuals. He had, he, uh, he had all of his brothers come except Solomon. And they all began to celebrate Adonijah was the king. Nathan the prophet was one of those that was not included. And he came to Bathsheba and said, hey, do you know what's going on? Adonijah has set himself up as the next king, tells everything he's done. He says, now I'm going to give you some advice. You need to take my advice because this is going to spare your son's life and your life. You need to go into King David and you need to say some things. In fact, I want you to say it exactly how I'm telling you to say it. And you need to declare to him that Adonijah is setting himself up as king and that he promised that Solomon was going to be the next king. And I'm going to wait outside, and as soon as you are done telling King David what's going on, I am going to come in, I'm going to back up your story, I'm going to share it exactly the same so that David will know for certain that this is exactly what's going down. Here's what it says. If you take your Bibles and you just jump into to verse uh, 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 17, Bathsheba goes to King David. She says, my Lord... You yourself swore to me, your servant, by the Lord your God, Solomon your king shall be the king after me, and he will sit on my throne. But now Adonijah has become king, and you, my lord the king, do not know about it. She tells everything he's done to set himself up, and just like Nathan said, right after that it says in verse 22, while she was still speaking with King Nathan, the prophet arrived. And they told the king, In verse 24, he says, Have you, my lord the king, declared that Adonijah shall be the king after you, and that he will sit on your throne? Today he has gone down, he has sacrificed a great number of cattle, he has fattened calves and sheep, he has invited all the king's sons, the commanders of the army, uh, Abiathar the priest. Right now they are eating and drinking with him, and they are saying, Long live the king in Adonijah. But me, your servant, I wasn't invited, neither was Zadok, neither was uh, some others. And then he says, is this something my lord the king has done without letting his servants know who should sit on the throne of my lord the king after him? I'd encourage you to read the entire chapter because there are some really interesting moves that are taking place. But it's interesting David did a few things wrong. The first one is that he was uninformed. He simply didn't know what was going on in the life of his kids. He didn't know what was going on in the life of his family. In fact, his, his little phrase is, I had no idea. I had no idea that was happening. In fact, you'll notice I actually said that if you get down to verse 18, it says, but Adonijah now has become the king and you, my lord, the king, do not know about it. Several times in this passage, he simply was uninformed. And as parents, one of the hardest things to do sometimes is to know what's going on in your children's lives. It's hard enough when they're not in school, right? Because you can't read their minds and sometimes they have a hard time expressing what's going on. Then they start going to school and you kind of look forward to those parent-teacher conferences because you're like, I wonder if the story I'm going to hear at school is going to be the same story that I'm going to hear from my child because, again, unless they share it, you just don't really know. And I got to tell you, you never stop wondering what's going on in your kids' lives. I was in college. I was a new believer in Christ. I was on fire. Man, when I came to Christ that first two years, I was on a growth plane like this. I was so excited. Everything I did, I ate, I drank. Everything was the Bible and Jesus. And I'll be honest, my mom was a little nervous. I got into a cult or something. She just had never seen this in me. 
So we came home one weekend and my buddy, uh, Greg, was with me. He was a senior and he was the guy who had been, uh, uh, had, uh, been discipling me. And <laughs> he told me later, he says, your mom really loves you. I said, really? Yeah, she pulled me aside. She asked me, is he okay? <laughs> and by the way, my mom kept asking that question right up until Jesus took her to heaven. She wasn't sure if I was okay or not. She probably still don't have an answer to that one, right? It's staying informed. David just wasn't informed. Now, the second mistake he made is that he just simply was uninvolved. I thought somebody else would do it. That was kind of his thing. And you'll notice, I didn't read this, but I want to read it to you now. Go back to verse 5 and 6. Now, Adonijah, whose mother was Haget, put himself forward and said, I will be king. So he got chariots and horsemen ready, 50 men to run ahead of him. His father had never interfered with him by asking, why do you behave as you do? Did you, have, did you hear that? His father had never interfered with him by asking, why do you do what you do? One of the hardest things in parenting is discipline. And, and it's because I think a lot of times we think wrongly about what discipline is. Frankly, I did discipline wrong for the longest time. Because I think we think discipline is punishment. Biblically, that's actually not what the word means. It means to train. It means to correct course. Now, sometimes it's unpleasant. Hebrews chapter 12 says, hey, none of us like discipline. We don't like it when our fathers would discipline us, but later on we rejoice because it produced in us a fruit of righteousness, of character. He says, same way, we don't like it when God disciplines us, but when he does it, it brings about character and growth in our life. See, discipline is not so much about harshness or punishment. It's about correcting course. And hey, can I just simply tell us that you cannot outsource this, parents. You cannot outsource this because discipline happens when discipline is necessary. You are the most influential individuals in the life of your children, either training the way in which they should go or correcting the course in which they have gone. But we, we have to stay involved. David simply withdrew. There's a third mistake, and I don't want to spend all my time on mistakes. I want to talk about the good things he did. But the third thing that I notice is that he was unintentional. He, he just simply assumed. He assumed that everybody knew what his wishes were. I, I, I told Solomon, I told you, I told key individuals. And so it's kind of one of those things. I said it when he was younger. I, I just assumed everybody knew that's what the plan was. In fact, when you read down through this, you can see that's exactly what's happening is that there was a little bit of wondering. He was kind of out of the picture. And so his son Adonijah took advantage of it to set himself forward. It's amazing that if we're not intentional as dads, as moms, as grandparents, as aunts and uncles, or maybe you are a caregiver or you're a, a foster parent, or maybe you have some that you have influence in that simply you are the role of Jesus in their life. And kids, so many times they will pick up things that we never intended for them to pick up. Um, I heard a, a, a child counselor one time say these words, children are wonderful at obtaining information. They hear way more than you think they hear. They perceive way more than you think they perceive. They see way more than you think they saw. They are wonderful at observing information. They are lousy at interpreting it. I'll give you an example. Uh, children were asked about marriage and family and parenting. These are actual answers to questions about life. For example, a little girl named Kirsten, 10 years old, she was asked, how do you decide who to marry? Here's her answer. No person really decides before they grow up who they're going to marry. God decides it, decides it all the way before, and then you get to find out who you're stuck with. <laughs> okay, there's a little truth in that, right? I'm praying for God's person in your life, and you get to find out who you're stuck with. 
Freddie was six years old, incredibly perceptive. Um, how do you, do, I'm sorry, how can a stranger tell if two people are married? Here's his answer. You might have to guess based upon whether they seem to be yelling at the same kids. <laughs> That's perception, right? That's really perceptive. Um, Lori was asked, what do you think your mom and dad have in common? She had the answer. They both don't want any more kids. <laughs> I really like this one. This is great. No, this is not great. <laughs> this is, Ricky has advice for all. The, how do you make your marriage work? Ricky, 10 years old. Tell your wife that she looks pretty even if she looks like a truck. Kids are perceptive, but they don't always translate the information and interpret it correctly. By the way, I can give you hundreds of examples. Mom and dad have a problem, they interpret it as we did something wrong. Grandma, grandpa passed away, their interpretation is, who's gonna be taken away from me and I'm gonna be all by myself. Now compare that to what God's word says in Deuteronomy 6, very familiar passage. When the Lord looks at Israel and begins to give them commandments, notice what he says. I gave it out of the Message Bible. I'm not sure if it's in your notes. You can just listen. Listen obediently, Israel. Do what you're told so that you'll have a good life, a life of abundance and bounty, just as God promised a land abounding in milk and honey. Then he says this. Love God your God with all your heart. Love him with all this in you. Love him with all you got. Write these commandments that I give you today on your hearts. Get them inside of you and then get them inside of your children. Talk about them whenever you, wherever you are, sitting at home or walking in a street. Talk about them the time you get up in the morning till the time you fall into bed at night. Tie them on your hands and your foreheads as a reminder. Inscribe them on the doorposts of your houses, your homes, and your city gates. Talk about them. Live them. Model them. Mentor them. Show them. In the teachable moments of life, not later when it's convenient, but when you're going through those things, stop and intentionally talk about them. And whether we like it or not, these are some of the things that we teach the next generation. We teach them about responsibility. We, we teach them about the consequences of our actions. We teach them about conflict resolution or the lack thereof. I remember we didn't do everything perfect in our family, certainly, but I remember one of the common conversations when our children were having issues, especially with people at school, friend groups, or teachers, we would stand back, and I, I remember saying this a number of times, guys, this is not how we're gonna do conflict in our family. We didn't always model it perfectly, but we talked about it. Decision making, how do you make decisions? How do you plan? How do you plan for the future? How do you parent? You are modeling that right now. By the way, if you are in a dating relationship, in other words, you're a single parent, and you are now dating, you are teaching your children what to expect and how to treat a man or a woman in your life. By the way, that goes for moms and dads. You are treating, you're, you're teaching your children how to treat each other. Stewardship, generosity, marriage. And society has figured out a long time ago, especially the culture that pushes what I'll call against Christian principles, they figured out a long time ago that subtle transitions and changes over a long period of time bring about huge results. Culture is really patient. So do we need to be. Because it isn't one and done. It is over and over and over with consistency over a long period of time. Now watch what David did right. He realizes I blew the hand off. I blew it. And I love what he did to recoup. Go into, go into that next passage, chapter 1, verse 28. Then King David said, call in Bathsheba, 
So she came into the king's presence and stood before him. The king then took an oath. As surely as the Lord lives, who has delivered me out of every trouble, I will surely carry out today what I swore to you by the Lord, the God of Israel. Solomon, your son shall be king after me, and he will sit on my throne in my place. Verse 32, King David called, said, call in Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, uh, Benaiah the son of Jehoda, and the, he come before the king, and he said to them, take the Lord's servants with you, and set Solomon on my own mule, take him down to Gihon, there have Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet, anoint him king over Israel, blow the trumpet and shout, long live King Solomon. That's what they did. People began to cheer, a parade began to form, and oh, by the way, all those brothers and all those officials that had gathered with Adonijah, when they heard what was going on, they realized, uh-oh, this is not going our way. And it says, one by one, they begin to walk out of the house. Can you imagine how lonely it felt for Adonijah as everybody says, hey, gotta go, gotta go, gotta go. And what was full of people supporting him is now an empty room and he's sitting there going, I am in big trouble. Now what did David do to correct course? Three things. Number one, the first thing he did is he took courage. He took courage. He could have sat there. He could have said, it's too late for me. He could have said, I've already done the damage. He could have said, kids are already out of the house. Kids are going to be what they are. Solomon's on his own. But I love that he took courage and he went back to the original promises that God had laid on his heart. And uh, there's this movie called The Edge. It's kind of a, uh, it, it's, frankly, it's a gruesome movie. It's a guy gets stranded in the wilderness. It kind of shows the best and the worst of humanity. But what's interesting, this guy, as they get stranded out in the wilderness of Alaska, no hope for anyone to rescue him, he said that one of the things that a person dies of when they're stranded is shame. It's shame because they, they don't do the one thing that could have actually saved their life, and that is to think. They simply sit there and die. King, King David said, I'm not going to do that. I am going to suck it up. And number two, I'm going to act. He made a plan that he acted on. Now, notice what his plan was. <clears throat> his plan was, first of all, to pass a spiritual baton to his son, he said, I'm going to have Nathan the prophet, Zadok the priest. I want you guys to go to take him and to anoint him. Now, why is that important? Because number one, it charged Solomon that this is a spiritual position you're holding. Solomon, you need to live up to it. But number two, it told the entire nation the anointing of God is on this guy. And then he did this. He said, I want you to put him on my mule I want you to parade him and say he's the king. I want you to put him on my throne. I want you to put him in, he's, gonna, uh, he's going to reign in my place. My, 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 and what he is doing, he is giving things of importance and positions of importance that identify with King David and he's giving it to his son. By doing that, he is doing this. He is letting Solomon and everyone of influence know that he affirms and believes in his son. And then the third thing that he does is he surrounds him with people who have influence and who, who, who will give him godly counsel. He gives him Zadok. He gives him the military leaders. Not only are they influential, but they also give him good guidance. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, that's not that big a deal. He had everything going for him. I will tell you that when Solomon handed off to his son, his son would not accept the counsel. His son got rid of all the older counsel and surrounded himself with only people his own age. And it destroyed the entire nation. He had a plan. 
When I was 23 years old, I had an encounter with my dad. It was um, years in the making. I, I would simply tell you that growing up, I didn't have the relationship with my dad that I really wanted. Never felt super close to him. We, we rarely went fishing once, I can remember. The only time we ever really did anything together was when we were working together. Dad was a hard worker. I, I have no doubt in my mind Dad loved me. I just didn't feel much like that when I was growing up. And I would tell you this, it wasn't my dad's fault. I built very much like my dad, literally, <laughs> but also built like my dad in that I'm very driven and that I, I, I think I'm right a lot. I've often wondered, oh my, how much fun must I have been growing up? I was a Christian, I was a strong Christian. I'd already been a believer for four or five years. I was already a pastor at 23 years of age. It was a Sunday afternoon. It was, seemed like a nothing encounter with my dad and it turned into a blow up. No vulgarities, there was none of that, but I was completely out of line. I, I said what was true, I didn't say it in a very loving manner. Went back to my dad an hour later, apologized to him. My dad shook my hand. He said, I forgive you. And, but there was this deep aching in my heart. How do I build a relationship with this guy? And I made a decision at 23 years of age. I remember exactly what I said. I can spend the next 20 years. I might get 20 years in my dad's life. Didn't quite get 20, but I was real close. If I'm lucky, I'm gonna get 20 years with my dad before he dies. I can spend the next 20 years being mad about the last 20 years or I can spend the next 20 years trying to build the relationship that I want with my dad. And I made a plan. The plan was every Friday morning, I was gonna drive 30 minutes up to my mom and dad's house. We ended up moving closer after that and so it wasn't near the drive. Then we moved away, a little longer drive. Every Friday morning, I'm gonna show up at mom and dad's house. I'm gonna take dad out to breakfast. Every single Friday morning, I'm gonna make this commitment. I called ahead to make sure he was gonna be around. I showed up that first morning. Mom thought by virtue she was invited too. <laughs> she, I show up, she's like, let's go, got my purse. And my dad's like, no, I got a lot to do this morning. I said, well, dad, I loved it. I came up here to do this, you know. And he said, well, maybe, maybe I'll join you. He did, he showed up. Next week I showed up, mom's got her purse, ready to go. Dad, uh, you know, I gotta get gas first. If I have time, I'll come and I'll meet with you. Showed up. Third week, my dad put on his coat. And over the next years, <clears throat> pretty much every Friday morning, breakfast with mom and dad. Breakfast with mom and dad. It's interesting, in 2002, when we were gonna move here, I knew that was gonna be a big deal. And I went out and dad and mom were in the back uh, yard and they, they were sitting on a swing. And I said, well, mom and dad, I got something to tell you. Tammy and I feel like the Lord is leading us to uh, take a church in Port Huron. It's about four, four and a half hours away. Dad is now the last few years of his life. We really feel like this is what God has for us. And uh, my dad did something that uh, I, I didn't think I realized at the time how important and how big it was for me. My dad took his hand and he shook my hand and he said, Phil, it seems like God has blessed every decision you guys have ever made. I have no reason to think he's not gonna bless you where you're going. Dad passed away, we had his funeral two, two days ago in 2008. And while we really didn't go fishing very much, Dad was not a fisherman, did it once, twice. Didn't go camping, dad wasn't a camper. Didn't hunt, dad didn't hunt. But no regrets. It's never too late 
until the Lord takes you or them to heaven. And I believe even then God will answer the prayers that we've laid out for our kids. Take a step. We well, have yeah, that should be my dad. No, no, no. I, I'm just going to tell you this. In Christ, he always calls those who are mature and who deeply want that. He calls them to make the step. David acted. And the last thing he did is he gave him in his last dying breath, gave him a spiritual charge. I didn't do this first hour, but God laid it on my... Every dad, every grandfather in the room, would you stand up? Would you just do that? Moms, this is for you too. Grandmas, this is for you too. But I, I just wanna, I wanna pray this. I wanna pray this over our dads. Can you just join me as we pray together? When the time drew near for David to die, he gave a charge to Solomon, his son. And he said, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. So be strong. Show yourself to be a man. Observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in his ways. Keep his decrees and his commands and his laws and his requirements so that you may prosper in all that you do wherever you go and that the Lord may keep his promise to me. Father, thank you. Thank you for moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas and caregivers and foster parents and aunts and uncles and teachers and Sunday school teachers and all the rest that are investing. Lord, would you just simply give us courage. All of us have made mistakes. All of us have probably dropped a baton or two. But Lord, would we live every day sowing into the generations to come until that day when you take us home. Thank you, Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen? Stand with me, would you? Turn to several people. Tell them it's great to see them. If you'd like to pray with someone, Pastor Brian and other prayer partners, we're here to pray with you this morning. God bless.